Yeah, so long title, on device, open source, mobile vector rendering above the street map. I'm going to talk, a kind of an intermediate level talk about some of the software parts that are going into this and what exactly I'm working on and kind of what Mapbox is doing, particular mobile stuff. Um, I was also, I'm going to kind of point to a lot of open source components within this stack that might be useful in maybe non-map uh, realms as well, which I know might be interesting for folks to kind of talk about the more general problems behind some of this stuff. Um, uh, by way of quick introduction, I'm a mobile lead at Mapbox. Um, basically, I do a lot of programming on iOS and Android as well as um, strategy for mobile related efforts. Um, I'm here in Portland. I work remotely. And um, yeah, because I work in mobile schools and strategy. Um, Mapbox, just briefly to let you know kind of the vehicle by which we're building this stuff. Um, we basically built uh, all of our stack is open source components, like hundreds of them that we put out on GitHub for people to use in all kinds of different problem domains. Um, and so that's kind of the, the free as a beer and free as a speech part. And then um, what we do as a business is set up cloud kind of uh, hosting infrastructure for uh, hosting map related technologies at large scale for applications and websites. Um, and like I said, we kind of break all those pieces down into uh, small or bite sized pieces that we can open source. Um, and then we're about 100 folks worldwide, two of them are in this room. My, co my colleague Lizzie is here as well. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to be talking about is what we call Mapbox GL. It's kind of a nod to OpenGL, if you're familiar with that programming, low level programming, uh, graphics programming technology. Um, it's our name for the on device vector rendering stack that we're building. Um, like I said, we open source as much as practical about our stack, and, and this, everything I'm going to talk about here is completely open source ESD licensed stuff. So you can use it as both a, a learning tool as well as, like I said, the, the component parts make it useful in other problem spaces, um, or just for learning other languages and technologies. Um, and the GL part, the thing that's that's different about all this, so I mentioned in the title, you know, it's on device. It basically means we're drawing the maps on the fly from data on the user's device, on a mobile device. Um, and it's it's GPU accelerated, which means we're basically taking advantage of dedicated hardware in mobile devices and the GPU, which is made just for number crunching and graphics and pixel pushing. And specifically addressing that with OpenGL technology to make it faster and be able to accomplish more things. And that, that's what makes it really practical to be able to draw all this stuff on the fly and not have it completely bogged down a relatively low power computer on a mobile device. So I'm going to feature a lot of kind of um, slide-based demos of things um, throughout the talk and kind of explain some concepts. Uh, I also brought along um, my favorite iPad and my favorite uh, Nexus 9 with the software running so we can uh, look at those afterwards. And, um, I didn't have a great way to hook them up to the display, so I'll just pass them around and come over and show some demos. So it's a small enough room that I can probably hold it up and we'll still get a good idea. But um, also going to um, show some things throughout um, with some small animations and things like that. Um, so, quick question now. How many people are familiar with OpenStreetMap before I dive right into the software side stuff? But I figure there's pretty high correlation overlap between open source bridge, open source folks, and OpenStreetMap. Um, for anybody who's not familiar, it's basically a crowdsourced um, mapping of data effort in the style of something like Wikipedia. Um, there's over 2 million registered uh, contributors to the map, and it's always changing and always being updated uh, with worldwide data. And so that's what we built. Um, the software around is ideally using um, the software stack that we've built to process that data, but the idea is it could be, we could use lots of other forms of data as well. Um, so the vector part of the title also kind of speaks to what's being drawn on the screen. I wanted to, I wanted to kind of break that down a little bit. So kind of traditionally, or, or until several years ago, probably the most common, even still a lot of places, the most common way of putting a map, a visual map up on a screen, either web or desktop or mobile, is with raster tiles. And so this would be like a literal image, typically a square, that's pre-drawn. It's just like downloading a photo. It just happens to be an image of a piece of the map. And the thing about those is uh, the way they work in, in, in zooming um, has got some limitations. So as you zoom in further on the map, you basically take the same image and scale it up, which works to a certain point. If you keep going with that, you start to get blurry and pixelated, and font size doesn't really make sense anymore. Um, it keeps going still, and then you reach this kind of threshold where it gets um, as large as it's going to go for this particular scale of the map. And then what happens is it subdivides. 
into four more tiles. This is kind of uh, what we refer to as a tile pyramid. You start with like the whole world in one tile, and you zoom in a little further, and there's four, four images of higher resolution. You're only looking at one or two of them, and you zoom in on those, and you're looking at one or two, and now 16 tiles that cover the world. It just keeps going down. But this kind of has some limitations um, when it comes to, to the visual aspect, because you can see as it changes back and forth in this threshold when you zoom in or out, you're going between one tile that's kind of over-zoomed and four other tiles, and things are kind of drastic in, in, the, in terms of the way some labels weren't there before, some labels um, get blown up in size. You're going basically between two different images, and at some point you're just making a snap decision and saying, okay, I'm switching the scale of the map. Um, another limitation with this sort of uh, raster-based technology is rotating. So say, you're, say you've got a mobile device and you're tracking the user's uh, compass bearing, like our navigation sort of environment. Um, that works pretty well when you start to rotate it a little bit like this, but it works not so well at all when you do something like this. These images are all pre-made, they're all just pixels. It's not ideal for, for a lot of mobile applications where you're going to be having a change of orientation. So to contrast raster tiles with vector tiles, and which are the, the parts behind the vector rendering of all this, um, you can't really see vector tiles, they're just data. They're chunked in the same way, like you've got you know, this square of the earth that we're going to render a particular resolution. Is we've got the data for that. It's just a binary data chunk that comes down. And we're going to draw that on the mobile device, um, the software. And I'll explain. You'll see a little bit of difference in, between what I just showed with raster tiles. But um, the, the tile pyramid kind of thing works the same way. It's this idea that every time you zoom in a little further, you replace the tile you were looking at with four tiles of higher resolution, possibly more data. You can redraw that. And the idea with vector rendering is that you make that change continuous as opposed to that that sudden jump that we saw in the last few times, where you're switching to one image to four images below it uh, all in one shot. Um, and so yeah, you render continuously between the zooms. I'll show an example of what this looks like. But label placement is kind of the biggest example of where this really shines and looks great on mobile devices. Um, you've got this idea of incrementalism. Like I said, you've got the jump on a raster technology between two levels. And at some point, it's just going to make that, that threshold and you're loading the new imagery. And, it's kind of drastic. Whereas when you're doing vector technology, every step along the way, you've kind of got these non-integer levels of zoom in order to go, you should be making determinations on the fly of how big the font should be or where it should be or which label should come into or out of view. Um, this kind of opens the doorway for things like zoom-dependent styling. So this is a, uh, I'll start this up in a minute, but this is a small cycle uh, animation of this GL rendering technology. And you can see when it zooms in, we'll just watch it for a second here. Basically, things are pretty continuous. Here I'm jumping full under zoom levels, and then I start to pinch them in and do a little more gradual stuff. But the idea is everything's being drawn on the fly, so you'll see labels pop into or out of view, collide with each other, new levels of detail, rotation collisions. It's this idea that this completely fluid map, and all of these things are being drawn on the screen many times per second, kind of like an animated movie. That's what the software is actually doing. Um, so this kind of opens up some interesting possibilities too. This is a small animation example that shows some contour lines of elevation. And what it's talking about here is, uh, this is the styling language, which I'll get into in a minute, but the idea of making line width a function of which zoom level we're on. So at zoom level 14 is one pixel, then it smoothly ramps to three, and then beyond that to four as you zoom. These are the kind of things you can do when you're drawing things on the, on the client side of stuff instead of pre-baking the pixels and, and downloading those as images. Um, and then what we saw a second ago, where things can rotate and, and collide and, and interact with each other, but you can still make everything legible, have the labels always facing up right, um, pop new le levels of detail, and then when we zoom out, and the city name, which doesn't make a lot of sense when we zoom in. Um, yeah, so it's not an either or proposition either. Um, you can kind of combine the two technologies. So rasters aren't going away. Probably the biggest um, category of raster imagery that's probably never going to go away is satellite imagery. And so if you're looking for aerial photography, if you're doing that sort of thing, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an image. It's meant to be a collection of pixels because that's what's captured with a giant camera in the sky. So um, you can actually combine these things. And so this is an example on the right of some satellite imagery. You can see a baseball diamond roughly in the center. And then drawing on the fly the uh, labels and 
the streets on top of that to get some context because you know the area of photography doesn't include labels and points of reference as to where anything is. So you can combine the two together. Um, as it turns out, when you're just drawing labels and roads and all that kind of stuff on the fly and applying, it's really easy to just sandwich a, a, a pre-made pixel image in there as well. So that's that's what the does combination. The other thing about all this is because it's being drawn many times per second, it's being drawn on the client side, on the device side of things, you can do some interesting stuff like style transitions. And again, I'll get into the style of language, but this is what it could look like. You could have a day mode and a night mode and a smooth transition over like a third of a second between the two. So this is kind of a non-practical demo, but it's going back and forth between the two modes to show you that it's all kind of live and on the fly and animated, essentially like a movie. Um, so it, you're able to change kind of each component, and again, because we're drawing everything on the fly upwards of many dozens of times per second. Uh, and then you can get really crazy. You've got a lot of potential with things like this. So this is a drone, uh, one of my colleagues took I have a drone fly over on a beach with some video footage, and this is sandwiched on top of other imagery because the drawing things multiple times per second to the screen, you can actually just draw these rasters or frames. So you can actually see people walking down the beach and the waves coming in on this one rectangle chunk. And so this could also be interlaced with the vector drawing stuff. Um, so yeah, enough of the, the, the demos and, the, and showing you all this stuff. I want to talk a little bit about the tech what goes into this and the component pieces and how you might be able to use them, even in non-mapping scenarios. So um, based on the stack we built, uh, we've done it uh, two ways. We actually built it twice. We built it for native devices, and we also built it in JavaScript um, for WebGL, for web browsers. Um, and so I'll, have, I'll put out the caveat that the JavaScript variant is not designed for mobile. It's, it's mobile, you know, it works on mobile. But if you're doing something on a mobile device that's got maybe half a gig or a gig of RAM, uh, a relatively constrained processor compared to a desktop web browser, you really want to go with the, with the, the, the native side of things. And, and we've written that. Um, the native side we've written C++ um, so that it works across platform. It works on um, currently on Android, iOS, Linux, and Mac desktop for development purposes. And um, we're doing some stuff with it server side as well with Node.js bindings so that you could um, uh, integrate it easily into a, a web application uh, or a back-end rendering application. Um, so on top of that, because it's it's largely focused as the, the native side is largely focused as a mobile framework and basically built for platform bindings on top of that. So if you're familiar with mobile development at all, you've done essentially Cocoa Objective-C, um, Swift stuff on top for iOS and Java for Android through the Android NDK and JMI binds into C++. So it's like 95% this core level right, C++ and then the language bindings on top that you'd expect if you're working on these mobile environments. Um, just out of curiosity, is anybody an active mobile developer? Either web, web or uh, native? Yeah, couple. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so a lot of this does apply, like I said, we built the stack on um, the web side of things as well. So everything I'm talking about also applies to the JavaScript framework if you're building into a web application, for example. Um, and all this stuff is open source on GitHub. Um, I'll point to some links towards the end of some specific projects and work on this stuff. And we also aim to support, we are doing it as a non mapbox project, we're doing it out as a software project to use even if you have, say, a customer Mapbox or a free customer Mapbox. So if you're familiar with mapping at all, um, flipping maps, you the raster style is meant to work with those sorts of standard URL schemes for pulling tile map content off of the web. And that's actually the same URL scheme we use for the vector data as well. Um, so kind of the high level goals of the project are um, to run on mobile and web both using the best frameworks. We did a little bit of investigation, it's like writing in JavaScript and being able to run that in a native environment on mobile and vice versa, writing in C++ to be able to compile that to JavaScript. Didn't have a lot of success with the level of complexity we needed to get to. These were already pretty darn complex projects, so um, adding that to the whole debugging chain didn't make a lot of sense for us. So we wanted to use what we thought were the best frameworks for each respective environment. Um, and we wanted to make it easy to get up and running in apps and websites. So it's pretty straightforward, despite being a, a both very large part of the code bases, um, it's pretty easy to like, uh, pull in an iframe or, you know, on a source JavaScript on the, on the website, things on the native side, you know, 
simply add a, a view or a fragment of the inside to your application, which is kind of one thing. There's a book map or a tangle in your app, they come in one step scenario. Um, we want to make it fun. I mean, it's just kind of neat to be able to, um, our platform is built around this idea of customizability of maps and not just having the map that the map provider thought was the best design, but to better fit it to an application's aesthetic or particular use case, or language localization, or any number of different factors. And so it's more a platform. So we wanted to make a fun platform and easy to iterate with and tinker with. Um, so we put a lot of work into to that side of things. Um, and then because it's open source, we wanted to build it on open standards. Um, existing stuff where it made sense, and if it didn't, try to promote some standards and ways of thinking about organizing the data and the problems um, in ways that were reusable in other projects and stacks. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of those standards and dive a little bit deeper on kind of the tech that goes into each of these and what, what that actually looks like. Um, vector tiles are kind of the biggest part of it. This is where we're, we're taking the open street map data and baking it down into these tiles. And so we do this for a couple different reasons. We wanted to eliminate a database from this equation, either that, that the user is maintaining or that we're maintaining on the stack side of things, because it gets real messy real fast. So if we can bake, bake things down into pre-tiled data, um, you don't have to worry about things like um, indexing databases or, or like performance optimizing your queries for particular geographic regions in order to draw them. It's already chunked down so that only the tiles that matter in the viewport of the map that you're putting up are the ones that are requested. And um, so it's kind of it's the x and the y direction, and then z is that, that dimension of the zoom level, the level of detail of the data. Um, we also do some stuff in the tool chain with pre-optimization for polygon simplification. Uh, it's basically if you think about think about like the border of a state like Oregon, the actual polygon that describes that at a high level of detail, probably tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of little polygon segments that go all the way around the entire state border. And it doesn't make sense when you're looking at the whole state or even the whole western United States to have to process all of those tens of thousands of little line segments for each state that you're showing. So at a low number zoom level, when we're zoomed out and say something like zoom level four, ahead of time we can say, well, you know, this can be accurately represented with these 36 lines. Um, and that's enough to draw a good looking Oregon until you zoom in further, and then you're at another level, another zoom level, another level of detail. Maybe that one's drawn with 400 lines, and then you go a little bit further, and that one's drawn with 1,000 lines, and it goes up to that max level of detail. So that when you're zoomed in all the way, cruising along the border, you know, a mile at a time, you're seeing the exact, you know, the tens or hundreds of thousands. So that's kind of built into this tool chain, and it's kind of an important part of building out a little stack. Because it's great, you can hardware accelerate all this stuff, you can draw all these map things on the client side. As you can imagine that in your resource intensive, there's a lot of stuff happening if you're going to do that many times per second. And so the smarter you can be about limiting the data, the better. And so that's why that's where this, this comes into play. And so the tool chain does this sort of thing. I mean, this is useful in, uh, in other applications. I mean, it's most specific to mapping um, because you've always got this problem of having complicated lines, especially if you're like doing a GPS trace of somebody's hike or a bike ride, and then needing to show that on the map or show a bunch of them on the map really uh, really quickly, you don't want to always have to consider all the complexity. Like I took a hike, I was at Marcus Islands a couple months ago, I took a hike a couple hours, and it's 2,500 point polygon. You know, it just does this loop. And, and at most zoom levels, when I'm zoomed out, it's essentially a pixel on the screen. So if I can, if I can pre-optimize that, that geometry, um, I don't have to worry about drawing anymore than the little black pixel that represents that height until you start to get close to it. It's four, then it's 20. And eventually it's 2,500 as you're tracing the path, or retracing the path, depending on the application. Um, so this format spec and the tools around uh, how to simplify this stuff are an open spec on GitHub as well. So um, with all of our specs, same as the software, we put them on GitHub. Um, so everything's under github.com, such my box. But this particular spec, how to do this stuff is, um, is uh, up there as well. So I'll break for another quick demo to show you maybe kind of cement the idea of vector tiles. Um, like I mentioned, vector tiles are data, they're not visual imagery, the same way the raster tiles are. Um, but they still draw into the screen. The, way we, the reason we tile them like that is because you only have to consider a certain chunk on the screen at a time. So here's a quick demo of that. I'll start just by zooming in. This is the vector framework. Uh, so we'll start zooming in. And if you, if you look carefully, you can see some areas of the screen draw before other areas of the screen. 
And what I do partway through here is go on and turn on a debug layer that shows the tile boundaries. And then you'll be able to see it a lot clearer how some areas draw. Some tiles draw before other tiles draw. So we're still drawing one tile, you know, four or five or six at a time. But I mean, in a particular square, all that stuff gets drawn at once. And you can also see kind of the pyramids can you the, the tile pyramid uh, at work here, where each tile subdivides into four more of higher detail, and more stuff pops in. So that's kind of how it works in Vector. It's the same way as when you're rendering pre-made images. It's just instead you're downloading data, and you're, you're saying, okay, I'm going to draw this square, and I'm going to draw this square, this square, and this square that are on screen. Um, and so the software figures out what squares are on screen, and what URLs it has to grab using this pattern, and pulls the stuff down. So the Vector tile stuff is kind of the whole core of this. And we designed it to work with OpenStreetMap data, but in theory, you can take any kind of geographic data and feed it in um, and time it out into these vector tiles, um, which are great even if you're not representing it visually. So the vector tile stuff takes care of tiling, slicing the stuff based on its kind of X and Y, clipping it so that if you're only drawing, uh, again, this comes down to like these complex polygons and polylines. If you're only drawing a portion of a border on the screen right now, it doesn't make sense to consider the entire border of Oregon. It only makes sense to consider the one in this tile that I'm concerned about. And so figuring out how to do that while still filling in polygons the right way is something that the software does. Um, does the pre-simplification. It's all in binary, the format that it crunches down to. You can do quote unquote vector tiles in other formats, like for example, GeoJSON. That's text. The trade-off, it's easy to read, it's easy to pull up in a debug, but it's not anywhere as efficient. Um, and so the binary format kind of reduces the, the overall size of the data. Um, and it also, I mean, this gets down to the nitty gritty level of like not specifying the number more than once and, and encoding only the deltas between two points. As opposed to saying this latitude, longitude, and this one, it's able to convert them and say this one, and then this one, which is this many different, which is usually a very small number, and, and just encoding smaller numbers essentially. Um, and so we have some tools, Mapnik, if you're in the geospace at all, you've probably been familiar with Mapnik, it's been around for about 10 years. Um, it's a project that lives kind of out beyond Mapbox stuff, although we don't have to sponsor it. Um, it's a software that can take all these data formats and render them into tiles, and now with a piece of software that we put together called Tile Life Bridge, it can render any of the geodata types that Mapnik can eat into this, this vector tile format, whether that's shapefile, or GeoJSON, or KML, or that sort of thing. Um, and then on the other side, you have the tools for parsing. One of those goes into this map render, obviously, to kind of pull the, pull the tiles and figure out what stuff's on screen. So we've also got JavaScript and Python libraries for those, which are a little more tinker friendly than the C++ variant. Um, and that'll take, uh, if it, it, also the transport mechanism is a protocol buffer, if anybody's familiar with that. But it'll basically take these tiles and blobs of data and parse them back out and say, OK, I have a grid of graph paper that's got these lines and polygons in it. What do you want me to do? You can draw or do it. So it takes these chunks of binary data and turns them into square grids that you can uh, render. The other part of this is the styling spec. Um, so because this is an open platform and we're interested in promoting this, the um, idea of being able to style the map however you want, we build a styling style spec for it as well, which is actually JSON. So you describe how you want the style of map in a JSON format. And that spec lives as a markdown document on GitHub as well. Um, and then we've got some reference docs up as well, which is, um, I think I'll show a picture on the next slide. But um, how do you say I want to color align blue with this opacity in this line? Um, that's what the style of spec language does. Um, and yeah, so. This, hold here for a second. This is an example style for the map that I was just showing you with the tile example. I mean, it gets long. This is the top. We've got that collapsed here a bit. About 500 lines of constant saying, like, this is white, blue, this is red, white, like all these kind of reused, reusable numbers and, and, and values. But it's just, you know, kind of straightforward, like you'd expect. It's got layers. It's got a background that is in particular colors. These are one of those constants, and it's got. In this case, we've got land cover and crop being some type of grass or, or you know, terrain that you want to show. So these are all the lower levels. And then as you stack on top of that, you get into stuff like maples and roads and your coffee shop and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I should stay over here. Um, so here's a little bit further down in the file. Um, here we're talking about a little bit of filtering language. So if the class of the, the data coming out of OpenStreetMap is sand, let's call it sand. 
and it's visible, and we're going to make it color. And then you say, I'm going to give us one more constant so we have to switch over to the same color, change the color. So. But it's just basically saying it's a fill, um, and it comes from different areas in the file. So this, as opposed to the vector tile format, is always in JSON. It's not a binary format, so it's really easy to kind of understand and pull up and, and tinker with. You could literally like download this style and say, I want Santa to be purple, and yeah, type purple, and then save it and watch the map update. And so it's, it's very tinker friendly. Um, and naturally, there's a function for this and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, it's pretty easy to start experimenting with the uh, map style. And one more, um, way down at the bottom of the file, as you can see, this gets large. Um, the rest of it is like 6,000 or so. Um, and granted, I formatted it so it expands out. But this is doing um, stuff more like um, using a text field. So this is a, for a suburb place where we use this font. And these are some text volumes. The same way we would specify fill color or line color, specify the font width, or we want to transform all the letters to uppercase and things like that. So it's got a lot of capabilities for that kind of stuff. Um, here's the one I was thinking about before. So we have a page on this that kind of gets to the different types of engine and style, like I mentioned, like the raster sources and video frames, and then the way you style and fills and lines and symbols and points and your icon and things, um, and then all the colors and strokes and stuff. So this is all um, through the document too. We also put up some example styles. So this is a repository of, of sample styles. Um, and I'll show, so on the tablets, uh, I have some demos set up, and I'll let you cycle through some of the styles and see the variety. Those styles are all on the screen mode. If you're just interested in checking out how they, how they put together. Um, and then we have a, a page around that that lets you go and actually experiment with them on your own without having to install anything on device. It looks something like this. So you can go up and pick the picker and, and go through the styles and interact and zoom, zoom with this and kind of see what it does. Um, and so this is software that you can then copy to your own web page if you want. Iterate on tweaking the styles or playing around with the software. Look, again, a little easier to take away from the JavaScript side than a larger C++ project, but um, there's kind of both sides of the stack to play with. So kind of back to the mobile side of things, this is kind of my wheelhouse I'm more interested in, and this is all great, but I'm kind of trying to picture where this can go, what kind of possibilities are unlocked by this. Um, and it's interesting because mobile doesn't necessarily just mean a phone. Um, it, it, you know, we think of it as the thing in your pocket, but it also it has different it has a different usage context. It's very personal. It's very hyper local. It's, it's where you are generally, or it can be, um, and it's very personal in that the amount of intelligence in the device related to your context and usage is a lot higher typically than your desktop environment. And that said, it's also a pocket computer with an ever increasing number of sensors. You've got altitude, very much pressure. Heart rate. I mean, this is technically a mobile device that does heart rate now. Um, all kinds of interesting things, and so yeah, wearables. Um, this space will continue to grow, and so we've essentially got these larger and larger arrays of sensors that you can use to influence a mapping, uh, a mapping platform like this. So here's just one example that a, a colleague of mine in Portland put together: the ambient light um, demo. So the idea that maybe your use case for an application. In a dark room, you want a low contrast map, kind of a night mode, because you don't want it blasting your eyes. And then as soon as you step outside on a day like today, you want to go to high contrast mode, so that you don't have to squint, or maybe you're wearing sunglasses or something like that. And mobile devices have sensors, so we could automate this sort of thing. So you can get a situation like this, where this is the this is the threshold of light or dark, and then as the light in the environment falls, you can use that kind of transition thing to change. And this is a real simple example, it's just kind of black and white, it's just two map styles. But you know you could you could change things about the the application environment uh, with any sort of sensor like this in any sort of way. It doesn't have to be two different map styles. It could be the font size, or it could be um, the color of you know, something, or the, you know the, the, the fill color of a building related to some other data on the phone about the users user having been in that building before, and you get to that building. Um, similarly, you've got things like phonometers and mobile devices where you can do things like change the map and photo density and scale. Like my, my iPhone knows if I'm running a walk, riding a bike, riding a bus, driving and flying. Like latent instance are automatically able to figure that out in an intelligent way. And so you could do things like if you're walking and running, you know, show dog parks and water fountains, but if you're driving, show highways. If you're, if you're 
running on trails, don't show the highways, or de-emphasize the highways, things like that. Similarly, you might find out where you show State Department orders and things of interest from the sky. Um, so yeah, what's next with the project? Um, so there's a lot of stuff going into it, and, and um, a lot of complexity, but some of the stuff we're working on is better higher level APIs so that you don't have to necessarily understand all the guts of this. You can literally do things as simple as hook this isn't there yet, but this is where we're going. Like, hook, you know, X light sensor up to this value of the map, and then it's able to change on the fly. Um, want to test on more devices, um, particularly on Android. I'm particularly interested in meeting Android hackers. Um, uh, my background's in iOS. We have both iOS and Android folks working on the project, both on the team and the open source community. But, um, uh, yeah, it's always it's tricky. There's hundreds of Android devices, so I want to test performance on them. Um, and yeah, I'm interested in what people could build with this, both on the um, on the uh, web side of things as well as the mobile native side of things. Um, so comments welcome. I'll have some content at the end. Um, closing, basically vector tiles, on device rendering. There's you're able to do this now. The open source software is out there. Um, we're not even the only one, but um, this is a project we're putting a lot of effort into, and uh, it is, uh, you know, we're in it for the long haul. Got a lot of app potential that we're trying to build these kind of all bearings, both map level as well as these component projects like vector tile, coding format, uh, parsing, creating those, style format, um, and all the little widgets that go together with that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, hackers are welcome. Um, here's some links. Uh, uh, we have a bunch of repos of things, uh, not even just related to this vector rendering stuff. Last count, almost 500 of them. On GitHub, so feel free to check those out. Oftentimes, we'll put uh, like you know JS or Swift or iOS or something in the middle of it. So if there's something you're interested in, you can find the Python PY. You can filter the repos down a bit because it gets a little overwhelming. Um, we blog a lot about this and other stuff, so um, that might be of interest to you. And feel free to reach out to me too. I'll email or email and um, yeah, that's all I've got. We're going to do a couple tablet demos. Um, like I said, I can't hook up to the screen, but. Uh, to pass it around and also do a QA in the last few minutes before we wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, anybody interested in a, a hands on? Or, or first off, anybody have a question? Thank you for coming.